Hi everyone, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Uh, let us know where you're joining from today. And I hope that everybody is ready for the holiday break coming up, ready for some festivities, maybe quieter this year, but still we can enjoy some time off. Um, get a couple extra bank holidays this year. Always great when Christmas lands on a weekend. I always enjoy that. And hello from Oregon. Oh, hello, hello, hi. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Florida as well, excellent. Some international guests. And we've got more people joining. So just letting the comments roll in, let everybody join in. Um, Massachusetts, so we have a large American following. I like that. Um, and, oh, here we go, somebody from Leicester. Hello, and somebody near Oxford as well. So everybody, great, thank you for joining today. Um, so this is the last live event for 2021. What a year. Uh, it's pretty, it's been a pretty crazy year for, for many of us. Um, thank you for sticking with us over the year. Thank you for joining even today and with all of the other live events we've had. And for today, we are gonna take a look at what we've done in the year. A little bit of a year in review, looking at the highlights of what we released to find my past, what changes we made, and um, what newspapers we released as well. So we'll start to take a look here. We've got more people coming in from Wexford and Utah, um, Ireland as well. Fife, hi everybody. Good to see where you're all coming from. It's really neat to see uh, people from all over the world. So uh, that's awesome. And let's jump in, let's get started. What are some of the 2021 highlights? So at Find My Pass, we released over 100 million new records to the site, over 5 million newspaper pages. For the first time ever, we have 1 million free newspaper pages for you to check out. Then we've added exclusive parish registers military and crime records that you'll get nowhere else except for Find My Past. We also added more than 14 million Scottish births, marriage and death records. So we're gonna take a closer look at some of these items, but please roll in with your comments and questions. Let me know maybe some of the, the favorite, rec your favorite records that you looked at this year. Does it have to be a record that we released this year? Maybe you just got started with Find My Past and you found something incredible. Please share your discoveries from 2021 and the highlights for your family history. So jumping straight into some of the new records we released. We released additional crime, prison, and punishment records. This is a England and Wales collection. We released 860,000 new records to this from 1784 to 1939. And the records come from some of the infamous prisons that we know the names of. So we have Pentonville, Wormwood, Millbank, Newgate. And within from those prisons, you can see the governor's journals. You can see trial records, list of visitors. There's lists of men that were uh, sent to solitary confinement. We even have some baptisms that took place in the women's prison. And overall, with this edition of records this year, the whole collection is 6.6 .6 million records. What an amazing collection for you to jump into. It's the largest online collection of British crime records. And it would include all range of crimes from petty theft to murder. Um, anything you can think of is in these records. And the amazing thing about these records is many of them include photographs. So we love those photographs. They, this whole collection was done in partnership with our friends at the National Archives. So that's where you can see the original records if you happen to go to Kew to check them out. But we've been able to digitize those and you can search them from the comfort of your home. And we do really enjoy checking out some of these uh, images, some of these photographs that we see of the, of the prisoners. And to take a closer look, you can see the way that um, these different records all link together. So if your ancestor had committed a crime, it's likely that their name will appear in this collection a couple of times, maybe two or three times, maybe even more, because we would have registers from the prison, you would have a trial register. Um, so for this example here, 
we have this individual um, who is Patrick Broderick. I had to look at that name again. Um, and he was in prison for stealing a pair of trousers. So we have his photograph now. So this year we released the picture of Fred of Patrick, sorry. Um, but then already in the records, you, you could have found his name in the calendar of prisoners tried at the spring general quarter sessions um, of the piece for the year of 1876. So in the calendar, you would see his name, his um, offense, what he was sentenced to. And then, like I said, this year, we just released the photograph. So that is a great reason to go back and check these records again. If you've already searched them before, look again, because we are constantly adding new records. We add records every single week to Find My Pass, and sometimes we add records to existing collections. So it does it give you a good reason to go back in, take a second look at the collection, dig through it again. And then the crime records are not complete unless you go and search the newspapers. Newspapers are the best place to bring the entire story together. So we have Patrick's name that appears in the Yorkshire Post and Leeds Intelligencer. So I highly, highly recommend if you find a crime record, go check the newspapers. Newspapers will often have additional details that are not in the official reports or the official registers. And it'll maybe even give you some of those details about what happened the day of the crime or what happened during the trial, who appeared in the trial and items like that. So definitely check out the newspapers. So what else have we released? Well, we added more records to our Catholic Heritage Collection. As you know, we have a large collection of Catholic parish registers. And these are in, we have registers from England, from America, from Ireland. So this year we added more to our England Roman Catholic parish baptisms, congregational records, marriages, and burial records. We added the Diocese of Plymouth, which first opened in 1850 and covers the areas of Cornwall, Devon and Dorset, apologies for the typo that I can see on there. And we also added um, records from the Archdiocese of Southwark, which covers the London boroughs uh, south of the River Thames and the county of Kent, as well as the area of Midway. So that also, that diocese also got started in 1850 um, by, both were started by Pope Pius IX, who was the Pope at the time. Uh, so these Catholic records are only available on Find My Past. You won't get them anywhere else. And we do have plans to continue to grow the Catholic Heritage Collection, especially in England. So there's a little nugget for you to look forward to in 2022. We will continue to expand this collection. And one item to note is that these dioceses, you can see that I've added there when they started, they started in 1850. So if you're looking for ancestors who may have been Catholic, but may have been you know, born or died before 1850, then you will have to check the um, established church records or the Anglican records or you know, the, the parish registers for them. Um, you will also maybe take a look at the nonconformist records that we have on the site because um, Catholic, par Catholic baptisms and um, marriages and burials all had to be registered with the established church. So take a look at those other records if you're trying to get further back. Doesn't mean that if they're before 1850, there's just no records. Search other churches, search other areas, and search the nonconformists. To continue on with the Catholic Heritage Collection editions, we added more material for our New York Roman Catholic records. So that is baptisms and marriages. The records that we added... Yes, sorry, Daphne, that is supposed to be Devon. I did have a little typo there on the on the screen. Apologies for that. Uh, the but so the New York records uh, come from Central Harlem, you have Northwest Bronx, you have Ulster County, Yonkers, and even more. And then we added Scottish Roman Catholic records. So we have I don't records from Bonnybridge, Glasgow, Wigmore, and more as well. So we have added a lot to this overall Catholic collection. And we have Ellie here with me, uh, who is quietly in the background, and she is helping with comments today. So again, please send in some questions. I'm going to try and start taking a look at them. And Ellie is going to send in some links to help you get more out of these records. Have you taken a look at the Catholic 
archive before. If not, we've got some really great information to help you dive into those or help. Um, we have a, a video as well to help you to trace your Catholic ancestors. So I do recommend taking a look at these uh, resources that we have for you. Uh, it's really, really helpful, um, especially when you're looking at these records for the first time. Oh, wrong direction. Oh, actually, now that I've gone the other direction, reminds me I forgot another really great piece of information about looking at Catholic records. Catholic records would have been written in Latin. Now, I don't know how many of you still know Latin or still have studied Latin. Um, I know I don't know it. Um, so we did create a handy guide uh, to help you with some of the common Latin translations um, because you will see words repeated, of course, parents and date and, and baptism or marriage. Um, so we have created a, a handy guide for you to take a look and that will help you to decipher the records, to understand them a bit more and understand, learn more Latin as well. So then moving on to the Scottish records, this is probably one of our biggest releases this year. One of some of our most exciting material has come from Scotland. And we have the, now we have the largest collection of Scottish family history records available online. So that's correct. If you're looking at Scottish family history, you definitely should come to Find My Past and check out what we have. Then the collection that we have is covers 450 years of Scottish history and covers every parish in the country. So in order to bring these collections online, we have scanned um, some of the images, transcribed them ourselves, original work, um, as well as worked with hundreds of passionate volunteers from local family history societies across Scotland. So there's two sets that I want to talk about, two types of records that you should take a look at. The Scotland Modern and Civil Births, Marriages and Deaths. We've released 7 million records into those collections. They've been compiled by several different sources including records from local government indexes, um, which would have been held with the councils or the archives, and then volunteer transcriptions from the local family history societies. There's some modern records um, and some indexes from the civil registers as well. So definitely a record set that you need to look at if you're interested in family, in Scottish family history. And then another giant mammoth record set that we released was the Scottish parish baptisms, marriages, and burials. We have 19.4 million records in that collection now. Um, and those are transcripts from the Church of England, or sorry, Church of Scotland. And it's the OPRs as they're known. So the old parish registers and material comes from across the country, um, including some later records that have never been seen online before. And we also added some supplementary records from other faiths. So you have the Scottish Episcopal Church, you have the Free Church of Scotland, United Free Church, and more. So it's a, quite a robust collection then. It's not just the old parish registers, but like I said, we have that supplementary material from, from other faiths as well. So it's a kind of a one-stop shop when you're looking at the parish records for Scotland. So do take a look at those. And please share if you have found anything um, in those records as well. There's a lot of comments coming in. So I'm trying to trying to take a look here to see um, how things are going. Um, we have just a general thank you for these broadca broadcasts. Thank you for joining us for these broadcasts. I really appreciate it. We love our community. We love that you guys keep coming back for more. Um, and also give us plenty of ideas if there's something that you're interested in or you wanna you wanna take a deep dive in or you wanna understand more about, please send us what you would like to like to know. We have some questions here. Of course, we have some questions about the lovely 1921 census that's coming up. That's our new year Christmas present to you guys in January. Um, and we also have just some love for just general Scottish records, excellent. Glad you guys are loving the Scottish material. So another unique collection that we added is the Francis Frith collection. So Francis Frith was a pioneering 
Victorian photographer. He traveled to the Middle East and to, the Pal and to Palestine, and then eventually he settled in Surrey, where he established his company as the world's first specialist publisher of photographs. And that company continued long after uh, Francis Frith uh, died and, and the company continued. So we have images captured from 1824 up to 2010. And here's a couple of examples of the images that you can get. You have a Main Street from Grenold in 1921, special year there. And then we have in Linton, the Dog and the Duck, a pub in 1955. And the really lovely thing about these kind of photographs I find is not so much that you think, you know, you're going to find a name or you're going to find your ancestor in them. It's just getting a sense of the time. Uh, take a look, look for the area, the, the county, the town where your ancestor grew up in. And you can catch some images from that time period was, you know, did, was your great grandfather born in, you know, 18, say 32 in a specific area in Kent. So search for that area and see what images you can come back with. And it is a great way to kind of piece together a real picture of your ancestor's life. It's wonderful to find a birth record and a marriage record, but it's lovely to find those bits in between like newspapers or photographs that really paint the picture and set the tone for understanding more about who your ancestor was, what kind of life did they lead. So we do have a little bit more detail about this collection in our blog. So if you're interested in the uh, photographs, I would recommend taking a look at that. Uh, Ellie can send a little post there. She's posted that link uh, for a blog post that we did about the Francis Firth collection. And please do share if you found any photographs that you really appreciated in there. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of photographs. So it is one of those sets that um, you'll take a look at and you next thing you know, 30, 40 minutes are gone because you just did a big deep dive and you've used every keyword you're thinking of or looking at different areas or you just kind of scroll through them. I mean, who doesn't love just looking at old photographs? Uh, and the quality of the photographs are incredible. So do take a look, spend some time. You've got a couple bank holidays coming up. You need a break from the family for a little bit. Jump into the photograph collections. And what else? So we have expanded our British military collection. So we have a couple of unique record sets from the Royal Engineers. These span from, well, the one collection is from the 19, from 1900 to 1949. And then the second one are these casualty cards from 1939 to 1947. And the best part about this collection is if your ancestor or your grandfather or father served with the Royal Engineers during the Second World War, then these are amazing records for you. Because as you know, Second World War service records are still with the Ministry of Defense. They're not available online to search so sometimes they're not easy to access without all of the relevant information. But if you do know that somebody served with the Royal Engineers, take a look at these cards. The casualty cards will give you the information such as uh, date of birth, date of enlistment, and the nature of the casualty. And then as new information was received about the individual, you can, uh, the casualty card was updated. So you can see in that example there that there's loads of different handwriting and ink because the cards were consistently updated. These are tracer cards, which plotted the soldier's movement um, within and between regiments. So uh, they're a really incredible, uh, important piece of British military history. And like I said, they cover that coveted second world war period, which sometimes can be difficult to find information for. And we then further expanded our British military collection. So there's three collections that I'm mentioning here. So we have the Indian Army record, Indian Army records of service from 1900 to 1947. It's an index of nearly 13,000 officers who served in the Indian Army between 1900 and 1947. After that, we have the British Army embarkation list from 1871 to 1899. And these were British Army soldiers who were sent overseas um, drafted for service in India between 1841 and 1889. Um, and then we have a long list of medals that we added to our larger Britain campaign gallantry and service um, medals and awards. So again, this is one of those instances where we've added more material into an existing record set. You may have looked at those 
um, campaign medals before. Take a look at them again because we have added more material. And those Indian Army and embarkation lists, uh, those are actually, these are indexes, uh, so they're transcription only. We don't have the images for them, but we transcribe the original records from our friends at the British Library. So you might be surprised to know that there are military records held within the British Library. So it's one of these collections that not a lot of people know about. Um, it will add information, it give you more information about some officers who served in the Indian Army up until partition, uh, may have papers lodged, and those they may have papers lodged um, with the Indian office in London. So most of these records relate to British personnel, although there are a few um, files related to uh, natives to India. And then if you find the um, information that you need, you can order um, original copies of the records from the British Library um, online, or alternatively, you could go and visit the British Library, which I highly recommend. Um, they have a location in Boston Spa in Yorkshire, and as well as in St. Pancras in London, both excellent locations, really friendly staff, and they're always happy to help, um, help you track down what you're looking for. And then we've added more Irish records. So uh, plenty of people are interested in Irish family history. We have the largest, one of the largest collections of Irish records online of any site at Find My Past. And we have added here some Board of Guardian minute books for both uh, for Waterford. And that covers three different unions. So uh, within Waterford, you would have different poor law unions. So the records that we have here are from Dungarvan, Kilmac Thomas, and Lismore. So they cover the period of 1845 up to 1922. So the Board of Guardian Minute Books are not the same as like a workhouse um, register. Uh, it is slightly different. It is the minutes that are kept by the Board of Guardians, essentially, um, who are responsible for the administration and the operation of not only the workhouse, but also poor relief. So this is out what they call outdoor poor relief, where um, you have individuals that are not going to stay in the workhouse, but they still need some support. So the minutes are of the weekly uh, meetings that they would hold. So within that, <clears throat> excuse me, so within those minute books, um, within those weekly meetings, you could find out more about individuals that are staying at the workhouse, um, such as if an individual, you know, is um, maybe a bit unruly at times, or maybe if an individual is going to go on and to do uh, maybe some training or go on into employment, uh, maybe the person would be mentioned because they're sick. So you do see sometimes that individual names are mentioned. You also get a sense of just what it's like to live in the workhouse. So they would have running totals of, you know, how many people have come in, how many people were discharged, how many people have died, how many births there were in the workhouse as well. Um, I'm always fascinated by some of the supply lists. I don't know why. I just find it really interesting just to see the supplies that are coming in to the workhouse as well. Um, you have, uh, so you would have food or, or linens and, and material like that. And then it would also have costs alongside it. So those are quite, quite neat to look at. Then we've added 20 more volumes to the Ireland Petty Sessions Court Register. So those were particularly from Ballyshannon and Cummingham. And the Petty Session records, again, like those England and Wales crime records, take a look at them. There's a massive amount of detail in it. There's over 22 million records in that collection. So we've just added a bit more, but we do do take a look at them. Um, and again, just like the England and Wales records, there's a wide range of crimes being committed there. So you do have, again, from petty theft, um, from, you know, uh, theft of a horse or being drunk in charge of a horse, uh, again, to your much more serious crimes of maybe murder uh, that you find in, in the records. And then finally, we have two collections. We have the Chancery Bill Books and the Exchequer Bill Books. So these are court records, um, and they generally have to do with disputes over land, tithes, um, ex -mon monastic lands, um, maybe some deaths or some wills. So it, it would generally be people that would have some kind of assets 
Um, they would own some kind of property or it could be a merchant or um, anybody like that would be named in these, but they do go quite far back. They go back to 1627. So they are a significant collection to take a look at if you're looking at Irish history. And we also, if you are interested in Irish history, we do have a video to help with that um, by one of our colleagues, Brian, who believes that Irish uh, family history is easy. Um, so he has some great uh, video and tips for you to, to jump into and, and take a look and to help guide you with your Irish family history questions. So just taking a look here, some of the uh, some of the comments coming in. Some love for that Francis Frith collection. Excellent. Um, yes, I mentioned you can look at it for 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, Sally can look at it for two hours. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, it is one of those collections that you just you don't even realize the time has gone by and you're still scrolling through these uh, lovely, high quality historic photos. So those are some of the big, big releases that we had this year. Um, but I wanted to mention some of the smaller ones. Uh, well, not smaller, but some of the um, non kind of traditional type of records sometimes that we release. So we this year we released the London uh, Fire Brigade reports from 1915 to 1918. And these are really unique. They're a fascinating and kind of thought provoking collection of reports from created by the London Fire Brigade and they've been expertly transcribed um, and they cover the air raids that happened in London between 1915 and 1918. So you can see some really interesting details about the effects of, um, of the raids. So you have, for example, here in 1915, there was a Jewish synagogue which was um, had been affected and you can see exactly what the damage is. So a back building of two floors, um, the contents were damaged by fire, heat, smoke, um, and water as well. And there was breakages. So it's really interesting to see um, how sometimes in cases you have just very little damage. And in other cases, you have significant damage where, a, you know, a building or a location could be completely destroyed. So you can check out these records by like a location. If you want to look at an address, a specific street. Um, maybe look at the, you know, the area around you, the street you grew up in or your great or your grandparents grew up in and take a look at and to understand was there any damage done uh, during the First World War to that area. Then another collection that I think is uh, quite special is the Warwickshire Coventry Midwives Birth Register. So this was all created by a specific one midwife. Her name was Mary, um, Mary Eves and she practiced midwifery for 35 years and she attended over 4,000 births. So this is her register of all the births that she attended. And the names are listed in three registers. Um, and now for the first time, we published them on Find My Past. So it's really kind of a unique collection. It's not very big, but I just find it incredible that this one midwife uh, created these registers herself. And now because of that, we have, you know, we have this information, we've been able to digitize it and put it online for the first time. Then we have the Leeward Islands census substitutes. Um, these are from 18 or sorry, 1678 to 1753. And these list the names of um, early name, they're early name lists for settlers in the islands of Anguilla, Antigua, um, Nevis and St. Kitts as well. So um, I do, I, they're really unique um, bit of information. I think there, I do recommend taking a look at the um, record set search screen uh, that you can get to um, through going to all records. So if you're at the, um, if you're at the dashboard, the home screen, take a look at the top at the search navigation and you can select all records. And from there, you can take a look at just one individual record uh, collection. And on that page as well, when you're looking at just one individual record collection, there is an abundance of information about that record collection as well. So I do recommend taking a look at that. There's a long history of the Leeward Islands and of the individuals named in these census substitute records, named in these, what was called name lists, and um, really interesting piece of history there. 
And then we added, just had to mention, of course, the United States obituary notices. We added um, another 22 million records to that this year. So a large addition to those. And then the England and Wales electoral registers, we added another 32 million names that you can search in those electoral registers. So we have changed the format of them so that you can directly search those by name um, and search them by address as well. And we added the years 1910 to 1919 this year. Um, and of course, the electoral registers are an amazing set of records to help you find your ancestor between those census years. Or maybe if you're starting to get ready for the release of the 1921 census, then you can take a look at the electoral registers and start to narrow down where your ancestor was living at that time. Oh, need a little coffee break there. Lots of chatting. So we're going to take a look here at newspapers. So uh, in this year, we have published more than 5 million newspaper pages from across 300 new titles, um, as well as adding additional pages to existing to, to titles that we already had on the site. And for the first time ever, you can access newspapers for free. We have launched 1 million free newspaper pages. Just an example of a few titles that we released. Again, we added 300 new titles, but then added to so many more. So we have the Railway News. It was first published in 1862. It described itself as the best known and oldest railway journal in existence, which I think is a very bold thing to, um, to claim when it's your first edition. Um, but, you know, uh, it was the railway news. It was a really um, unique topic if you're interested in anything um, about railway work. So if you do have an ancestor who was involved in the railways, this is something for you to take a look at. I really recommend taking a look at the newspapers, um, but also looking at the newspaper titles that we have. Really kind of go through that title list to understand what there is. Because if you're, um, you know, if in your family history, somebody had a specific job um, or lived in a specific area, we probably have a newspaper related to that. Uh, so take a closer look um, I love reading those kind of newspapers who say like the railway news and you just get a sense of what it's like to work in that industry. Then we added athletic chat. So this is just another title to our long list of sports titles that we have. This one was published in 1900 originally as of athletic chat, but then it did change its name a few times, went to um, football chat and then athletic and sporting chat. And it featured all types of sports. So you had racing, cricket, swimming, golf. But the main focus of the newspaper was did become football. And that was mainly due to the growing popularity of it. Um, it did, does have some really lovely uh, neat illustrations, as you can see there from that, that cover image. And I always love just a really bold kind of front page, especially for those illustrated titles. And then we also released the Labour Pioneer. So just to highlight that we have a long range of um, political titles or titles um, related to you know, specific parties or interests um, from all sides as well. So this one is the Labour Pioneer. It's the organ of the Cardiff Socialist Party and was first published in 1900. At the time, it cost half pence. And then this mad title. I just wanted to give it some special attention. This is the phonetic news. So it was started by two gentlemen, Alexander Ellis and uh, Isaac Pittman. And it started in January 1841. And it became came to be out of their interest of the study of language, um, as well as their study of um, phonics as well, or phonetics. And what they believed was actually, they, they wanted to kind of kickstart Spelling reform, something I've never heard of before. Yes, there is a, a push for spelling reform. And they believe by using more phonetic spelling, it would actually increase um, literacy rates and actually help education. So um, also Alice has a claim to fame to be the prototype for uh, George Bernard Shaw's a character, the professor um, Henry Higgins uh, from P Pygmalion or as we often, many of us know it as uh, the musical, My Fair Lady. So he believes that he was, he was the um, inspiration 
for that character. But unfortunately, the fanatic news didn't quite catch on. It did only last uh, a short while. It was already finished by 1849. Um, but you can see there, um, like I said, uh, in the first, the very first edition, they have a long list of why, of the reasons why they believe um, that that individuals should use phonetic spelling and why they believe in spelling reform. And then we have an article there of a Manchester meeting and the entire article, like the whole newspaper was spelt like this. Um, it is supposed to be easier. I be honest, I actually struggled with it a little bit, um, found it a little bit difficult to read at times, but definitely a really interesting concept. And if you are interested in language and phonetics and this is the newspaper for you to check out. Um, but unfortunately, it did only have a very short run. And then finally, again, just to mention, we have free newspapers on Find My Past. Um, and this was following our extension of our successful partnership with the British Library. We have such an amazing partnership with them. And that is how we are able to digitize millions of British newspapers every year due to that partnership um, and our access to the National Newspaper Archive. So part of that extension is that we are committed to releasing free newspapers um, onto the site. So back in, I think it was August, we released our first 1 million free newspapers and we will be releasing more in 2022. The free pages consist of 150 titles and they span from 1720 to 1881. Um, we have, to, in order to search it, it's really easy. You just go to the newspapers page and there's a selection on the left-hand side to just say you want the, the free newspapers so you could search those on their own as well. And just check in the comments here. Um, oh, great. So uh, our Jen Baldwin uh, has said that the railway news is helping her to understand her ancestor uh, who worked for the rail in the US better. So great example, Jen, of how even though these are British newspapers, they have such a wide history and a wide amount of interest. So even if you are in the States, do read the British newspapers. Uh, it's remarkable the amount of American history you can find in the, in the British newspapers. And beginning to wrap up here, I wanted to uh, point out some of the changes we've made to the sites. Um, you can see here we have added the census address search. So for the first time with our special bespoke address search, you can search for a specific address from the census from 1841 to 1911. And it's an amazing tool for you to use if you're digging into that house history of yours. Um, it's a really interesting hobby that a lot of people are picking up. I know I've just uh, moved into a new house, which is why uh, I'm a little bit bare in the back um, at the moment, but we are still unboxing everything. And I have to say, I have an envelope sitting here with all the old deeds and I haven't looked at it yet because I just can't get distracted because we do have that, that small project being launched next year. Um, but I cannot wait to dive into my house history. So this is one incredible way to do it. You can search multiple census records all at the same time and take a look at your address. And then also when you look at these uh, census records, we've added a little bit more detail. And like I said, with those newspapers and with those photographs, this is another way to really add context to the records you're looking at, get a sense of the history that your ancestor um, was a part of. So we have um, below the transcript. So when you look at a record and you see the transcript, then just below it, you can then take a look at the, um, oh, move that way. So then you can take a look at a historical map. So you can see the exact area that the, that your, um, that the house was in or your, where your ancestor was living. And I think that's really great. Um, I know for me, I'm not from England, but sometimes I'm looking up, you know, English ancestors. Um, and it helps me to kind of get a sense of the area to understand what it looks at. Like, and then there's also layers of maps too. So there's like maps from different time periods. So it helps you kind of layer on top to see what it looks like today as compared to, you know, say the 19th century. We've also added the description from the Gazetteer of England and Wales. So these give you a, a physical description 
of the area that your ancestor lived in. And then finally, there will be a newspaper headline. So it's a great way for you to then jump straight into newspapers once you found that census record to get to know more. And I would be doing um, our colleagues an injustice if I didn't at least mention another item that we completed this year and we're still working towards the final finish line, but we did complete the digitization of the 1921 census. So we have assessed and conserved 130 tons of census documents. We've captured over 18 million images, transcribed the names of almost 38 million people. And then with that, we are at the moment weaving this entire collection together to create an amazing online experience for you. So there is still, uh, we're in the final stretch, but it is coming soon. So I hope you guys are looking forward to the new year to start getting uh, a look at the 1921 census on the 6th of January, only on Find My Past. But until then, I hope you take a look at some of those records that we released earlier in the year. I hope that um, you enjoy your break, enjoy your holidays, and thank you again for joining us um, so often with these broadcasts. We really do appreciate it. And that's going to be us. That is us signing off from By My Past for the year, signing off for 2021, the final broadcast. I think we've come a long way. Um, just taking a look at some of the comments here. Thank you for all. Well, Roz, thank you for joining. I hope you did get some really good information. Um, and Daphne, Merry Christmas to you too. And everybody, yeah, I think that's that's great. The great love is flowing in from all of our um, all of our followers here. So we can't wait to see you guys next year. We're going to take a little bit of a break. We have some extra work to do and we'll see you in 2022. Thank you, everybody.